نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الوالي الكريم وصلى الله على أنبياء أجمعين والمسيح والمحسي والمجدد لما المرسلين Are we not the bearers of witness that nothing would exist if Allah didn't create it? And that He is alone and has no part. And that all gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sustainer of all the boundless universes. All gratitude is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the generous eternal friend. And send salutations of Allah on all of His prophets and His apostles and on the Messiah, the anointed one. And on the Mahdi, the God, and on the Mujaddid, the Reformer, which was all sent from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, we send greetings and we send peace throughout the boundless universe to all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi taala wa barakat. And now the true light, featuring El Sayyid El Imam Isa El Hadi El Mah. Uh, Psalms 23.1. Can you, can you uh, translate this, Imam? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside the still water. He restoreth my soul. Can you give me this interpretation right here? Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Wait a minute. I'm with you. First of all, let's establish who's talking. Right? Because this is what happens with Christians. They don't do that. This is David talking. Right. Now, why did David say this? I just want to understand. I don't understand. Why did he say you, know, that? you know why you don't understand? Huh? No, I because don't. you're a good student. Now I'm going to show you how you're missing something. When I show it to you, you're going to go, oh, yeah, and I told you to do this. Go back one chapter. What's the chapter? 21, 22. Yeah, 22 is usually before 23. Right. Yeah. <laughs> What's the first line? Oh, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? David is making a proclamation here that Christians say that Matthew 27, 46 belongs exclusively to Jesus when he was on the cross. They say when Jesus got ready to die, if anybody turns their Bible to Matthew 27, 46, where they say Jesus was on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me, right? right? But a lot of Christians don't know that that was not Jesus' statement. That man on the cross was quoting David. Now look at Psalms 22 and ask the Christian to explain to us or you how Psalms 22, chapter 1, has the exact same statement as Matthew 27, 46. Have somebody read Matthew 27, 46. At about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, the Mexabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, they say that's Jesus. Now, let's go back to the year 460 BCE. 460 years before the Christian era, not before Christ, to get to Matthew 27, 26. And now we go to Psalms 22, when they say, this is the Psalm of David to the chief musician, right? No. Ajilat, Shahar, these are names that this Psalm was ascribed to. And David is saying, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? David was crucified on the cross. You understand? Yeah, that's what I told you. Now, I just, want, I just want to go on with you. I mean, if they need more, I mean, it tells you in this quote. You read this whole thing, right. it'll tell you about them casting his lots, and it tells you in there that they bound his feet, they nailed him. It tells you in Psalms 22 that David was nailed on a cross, and they, they cast his lots over his garments, and then 40, I think it's uh, 44 picks it up again, is it? And discusses it again. Now let's go to you what you want to know. Now that you understand what preceded it, right? Right. Now let's see what David says. He says, Arab. Or the sustainer is my shepherd. Right. I shall not want. I have no needs. 
He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me besides the still waters. He's talking about heaven now. The Quran clearly speaks about the green pastures and right. under, beneath them are still waters flowing, right? Right. He restoreth my soul. Remember when Jesus was supposed to be on the cross and he said, Father, Father it is over. Right. Unto your hands I send my soul. At death you get your soul restored. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me to the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Now he talks of his experience. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff do comfort me. The rod, where I'll be chastised for what I have done wrong, and the staff, where I will be guided for what I have done right. David knew he had did some great sins, and if you read the scripture, you'll find out. David was not, you know, what we call Muhammad, a perfect example. Okay? Right. Then he says, Thou hast prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You know, Father, he had, when, when he was there dying on the cross, when he was there suffering, the Lord still prepared Maida, as they say about Jesus in the fifth chapter of the Quran, the table. He spread out the table for him. What else? Thou anointed my head with oil. You have made me a messiah. Christians don't want to see that. They look in their Bible dictionary under the word messiah or Christ. They'll find out it translates anointed. You have made me your anointed. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. I have so many. So many bountiful blessings from you. My cup is running over, David says. Right? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And what did he say? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He's talking about now that he's going to die. Goodness and mercy followed him all the days of his life. And now that he's going to die, he's going to spend that time in Jannah. You understand? But if people would only read the chapter before it, they'll see that it's talking about him dying on a cross. Okay? Shikra. Okay, now you... Yeah, keep attention now. You got a lot of work out there. I want to know, are we the only planet cursed with a devil and, and demons? No. All right. No. You're, you're the only one where you have allowed the devil to incarnate through you physically as well as mentally and are still breeding their seed. See, if you go back... In the, in the books of Genesis, you'll find that in Genesis chapter 3, you'll find that when the serpent was being, you know, type mess up. You'll find out that when the devil and the woman will receive in their judgment in the third chapter in the 15th verse of Genesis, it says, I will put enmity between thee, talking to the devil, and the woman, talking about Eve. That's all who existed then, right? And then the next thing says, and between what? Between that seed. Your seed and her seed. her seed. This woman was Eve. And we, as according to the Quran, are the descendants of Adam. Made into many hues and colors and shapes and races. Came, but we all came out of Adam and Hawa. And the devil has a seed also there. Not just a spiritual, but a physical nesala seed. Now... Man is doing everything that Abraham and all of them was told not to do in the same book of Genesis. Not to mix their seed with the Canaanites, amongst whom they dwell. So, um, Abraham says in 15, it tells us in 15, 13, where our seed would be. Someone read it. And he said unto Abram, know of a surety that that seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And Genesis 24, 3, read that. And I will make thee swear by the sustainer, the creator of heaven and the creator of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among, among whom I dwell. So, and this goes on. Abraham did it. Isaac did it. Told his sons not to marry him. Jacob told his sons not to marry him. And some of them intermarried anyway. 
This is the seed of Satan. People on earth are willfully breeding the seed of the devil in earth. If I on this planet, the answer to your question is, yes, other galaxies are plagued by what you call the devil, and he takes on many different forms according to the species of that galaxy. So was uh, Iblis, Iblis was the first cast down, right? To Earth. To Earth. You're only talking about the planet Earth. Because but, you, go ahead. But others rebelled before him. Definitely. If you read the book on Nebi Noah, the prophet Noah, I give a total explanation on that. The fall of the angels. Okay. And all the Sahuf covering. I shook on you If you read the 12th chapter of Revelations, uh, the seventh verse, it talks about that fall. Read it. Revelations 12, 7. 7. Okay. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay. I'd just like to know the, um, the, where in the Holy Quran it, uh, is the Mahdi described physically? You will not see any place in the Holy Quran where the Mahdi, Muhammad Ahmed, is described physically. You will not see anywhere in the Holy Quran where the Prophet Muhammad is described physically. Allah doesn't take time out to do things like that. You will find in the writings of men about the Quran, which Muslims refer to as the Hadith, where they describe Muhammad physically, and there is also an abundance of recognized Hadith or Sahih, where they describe the Mahdi. But you will not find a description of any of them in the Quran, none of the prophets. Okay, can I have a, an example of where the, someone did ask me, in because um, I... I spoke about the marks, and I would like to know where... I did a whole book called The Call of the Mark. It's a little pamphlet. When you leave outside the door, tell them I said to give you a copy of The Call of the Mahdi and about the Ratib for free. Thank you. All right? Salam. Um, I would like to know um, how... Uh, first of all, Hebrew, right? You says in, the meaning of it is to cross over, right? Um, how did it become a language? That's a good question. Now watch. The people in England speak what? English. The people in France? French. You see that? Now, how about cuneiform, the language? How come they're not calling the, the language of the Egyptians uh, Egyptian, they call it hieroglyphics. You see that? How come they're not calling the language of the Babylonians, Babylonian, they call it cuneiform. The man-made languages are named after places. The original languages are named after incidents. I'll give you a perfect example. The word Arabic comes from the word Arab to roam from place to place like a Bedouin. The people said, those people who roam from place to place, they would be called Arabs, and they speak Arabic. Those people who crossed over the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, they were Hebrew or Ibra, so their language must be Hebrew. <laughs> you see what happened? Hebrew is Arabic. It's the exact same language. And it should be called Adamic, really. It should be named after Adam. The name Arabic or Hebrew is really describing the people and something they did that's not really the name of a language. There is no name for a language, really. Think about what's your question. There really is no name of a language at all. You understand what I mean? So, um, how all the languages in Africa, you know, there's a lot of, like... Those are dialects, and they come about by... What's that thing you have around your neck? Africa. See? You didn't say a pendant or a necklace. You called it Africa. So you just added something new. It is the map of Africa. You're right. But you didn't say it is a pendant. You see? 
with the map of Africa. So now as people move off into the bush and they see new fruits, new vegetables, and they describe things different ways and how they go about doing things, eventually, after uh, hundreds of years, this graphs into a dialect. And now if they're speaking a certain language that they got while in Babylon, by the time they get to Africa, generations after generations, the pronunciation gets weak. For instance, in the Nation of Islam, they used to get up and say, I greet you in the Arabic language. I salam alaikum. And all Americans now walk up to us and say, as salam alaikum. There's no such thing as as salam alaikum. It's as salamu alaikum. But until you learn how to speak it properly, you will have the American dialect of Arabic. You all don't say naam. You all go naam. You all don't say bismillah. You all go bismillah. Eventually, if you train your children, they can perfect the pronunciation. But most of you people, you don't say Muhammad, you say Muhammad and Abdullah. You understand what I'm saying? And Islam. These are natural dialects. Eventually, if you spoke fluent Arabic, you'd have an American dialect of Arabic that an Arab would have a difficult time understanding. Y'all could be rattling on back and forth and everybody understand you. Just like if a brother comes from the mountains of Jamaica and has been living up in the mountains of his life and comes to New York or go, and goes to Georgia, or I mean, the better goes, comes to, American goes down to Georgia, Alabama, and starts talking to them, to them, they might think, bro, is speaking another whole language. Now, to him, they're speaking with this country draw, with y'alls and down the road of peace. And as far as he's concerned, they're speaking another language because the environment produced uh, dialects out of the same language. That's all you're talking about. So Arabic and Hebrew are nothing but dialects of Syretic, the ancient language. And that Syretic was named after the place, Ashur, or Syria, where Abraham lived. Okay? Salam. Good afternoon again, Imam. Uh, I don't know. My name is Randy George. And uh, I, I want to know what name I should, took, I should take as an, uh, in Arabic. What should I call myself? Or what can I call myself to make the, you know, my name? I, I understand what you're saying. I'm just looking mm -hmm. at you. I understand what you're saying. I'm just, I'm just looking at you. Yeah, because here, here I am uh, speaking English, yet I, if I believe in, in, in what I'm being taught, I have to know at least what, why I'm being taught this, if I, uh, or since I have to, in a sense, be reconverted myself uh, to, to Islam. And you have to re-study and relearn. Yes, I understand that. Your name is Idris. I Iblis. Idris. 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 <laughs> uh, it sounds like English to me, you know what I said? Well, it's Arabic. It's mm -hmm. Idris, and it comes from the word Darrasa, one who studies and has to learn about himself. I quite understand you now, much, much better. So your Thank name you. is Idris Abdullah Muhammad. I understand you much, much better. Okay. Thank you. We now have available over 70 hours of True Light tapes, spoken by our teacher and guide, as Sayyid Al-Imam Isa Al-Hadi Al-Mahdi, that cover such topics as message to the black man, slave trade, is nature man's worst enemy, truth is truth, AIDS and homosexuality, and much, much more. These tapes will serve as a constant guide in your growth and knowledge of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I came to class a few weeks ago Oh, about four weeks ago, probably, and I asked a question concerning the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 3. And it says, Allah came from Timan, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Sila. And I was questioning, what did they mean by, you know, they say God, but we know Allah. I was wondering what they mean by Allah came from Timan. I had a confrontation with one of Farrakhan's followers over this. Alright, this is a book revealed in Judea, in 628. Right? Timan, when they speak about this, they're speaking about the same thing we teach in Islam when we say that Muhammad is the comforter and that is the Holy Ghost. You follow that? No. They would say that if you came from, let's say, Mecca to an a infidel country and you brought Allah's teachings, that's the same thing as a Hebrew expression that they're saying God came from Timan and the Holy One 
The Holy One here is the Prophet Muhammad. And they use Mount Paran. If you do a research on Paran, it's the word Faran. And Faran is Mecca. That's the ancient name of the city of Mecca. And they tell you right there that he is the Sila, which they said the scepter would be passed into his hands when Jacob made the covenant about the comforter. And they speak about Muhammad as a comforter. They say that he is, in St. John, they say the comforter who is the Holy Spirit. You see, so he had the spirit of Allah moving in him the same way Allah says he put his spirit into Jesus. So in this sense of God, does not mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It means Muhammad came out of, out of Mecca with the word of Allah. You follow? He was the Holy One. He was the Sila, or the one, the Shiloh, the one that the scepter would be passed into. That's all it's talking about. So when they speak of God in here, they're actually talking about Prophet Muhammad? No, nope, they're talking about the message he brought. No. God came from Timah and, and the Holy One. See, God, Muhammad brought the message of Allah. No, could, is there some way I could assimilate that to the brother, like um, when Donald Elijah Muhammad says that um, Allah came in the person of Master Fraud Muhammad? Would it yes. Be? I don't have no argument with that. I don't have, I don't, I don't argue, me and Minister Louis Farrakhan get along quite well. I don't argue with them saying that uh, Allah came, listen this close, Allah came into the personage of Master Farah Muhammad. That don't bother me, because I understand what, he, I understand what they're saying. And they tell me that Master Farah Muhammad is Allah who created the heavens and the earth, then I'll laugh. Because then I'll ask him, what was he standing on? Because he's a man. You understand what I'm trying to say? But if they say he came into the personage of Master Prophet Muhammad, I don't doubt that a man can be inspired by the spirit of Allah to do a great work in America. And thus you say that Allah came into the personage of Master Prophet Muhammad. Allah came into the personage of Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Allah came into the personage of uh, Rasulullah Muhammad. Allah came into the person of Jesus and made him his Messiah. And you understand what I'm saying? No. I have no problems with it. That's why if you read that Article 12 on the back of Muhammad Speaks, it's under Article 12, read it close, you see that he says, also the Messiah of the Christians and the Mahdi of the Muslims. So he knew that Allah Elijah Muhammad knew that Allah, Messiah, and Mahdi was not the same. He was saying, according to what the Christians are looking for, this is him. According to what the Muslims in the East are looking for, this is him. This man is the supreme being. And then in his book, Message to the Black Man, he breaks down what he means by a supreme being. He says a being is a mortal thing. And he gives a full chapter on the meaning of God as a spirit and God as a man. And he says he's real, he breathes, he has hands, he's so-and-so, and so-and-so. So, -and -so. so he's defining Master Farah Muhammad as a human being who has been inspired by the spirit of Allah and that he was the wisest man in his time. He said what a supreme being is, is the wisest man in his time. All men are God, he said, or that's what he says, who are you, the Asiatic black man, maker, owner, cream of the planet, father of civilization, and God of the universe. So he said that all black men are God because we all have the spirit of the most high in us, and he says that by saying God of the universe, that's how you know he's saying the spirit of Allah is in us, because you're on earth, you're not in the universe presently. So the spirit must be working from the universe in through you. So Allah Elijah was very clear, it's people after him who misinterpreted their teachings because they wanted to make him look like he was a blasphemer. They wanted wanted to make him look like he was an idol worshiper because the pale Arabs brainwashed them into trying to destroy another great black leader. That's the key. Don't let the black man in America have any black leaders that they can refer to. So every time we get a black leader, we get al Haj Malik Shabazz, they say he turned against Elijah Muhammad, he banned him, and everybody stopped liking him. Noble Dua Ali, they got him down. Marcus Garvey, they got him down. Every leader, now look at poor Jesse Jackson. He was on his way up there and they made him calm out. You know what I'm saying? Now, if we was to invent our money, whose picture would we put on it? Tugman? If we would have our money, see, the white man got his money. And on his money, he puts his great leaders, right? Look in your pocket. If you don't believe me, take out any money and see. So if we was ever to become an independent nation and had our money, whose picture would we put on it? Nobody. Nobody, because the white man manages, after each one of our great leaders, by the time they leave, he always defames them. Oh, Elijah Muhammad had sex with all his secretaries. You know what I mean? Jimmy Swagger had sex with a prostitute. And he's still preaching. See, the white man has a way of defaming us and stripping us of our leadership. Because without a, a direction to lead the children, there's no hierarchy. There's an inferiority complex being constantly drilled into our kids. 
they are under white teachers and white presidents and white kings and everybody in history is white and and, and um, angel food cake is white and devil food cake is black and devil dogs are black and etc and etc. Bad guy wears a black suit, good guy wears a white suit. You know what I mean? And the white man is trying again to destroy the image of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So we won't have any black men that ever did anything great that didn't do it in his name. And see, that's the key. If they do it like him, if, he, if they're Uncle Tom, and they do it the way the white man says, then they want us to idolize them. But if he's someone who did not do it, he did not rub the white man's spur the right way, then they destroy his image before he's out of office, and they turn us against him, and then we'll take down the messenger's picture. You should teach your children about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and put the picture up in your house and say, that is one of your great black leaders, one of the founding fathers of Islam in America. You understand what I'm saying? And he did this, 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 because you can't find a black man, Marcus Garvey, Noble Drawley, or any of the knuckleheads out there today that can match what that man did in America. I mean, and especially during the time that he came to do it in. Am I right? You're right. Think of when he came, when the Klan was hanging black people. Nowadays, after the 60s, we can tell a white man, better bug out. You know what I'm saying? We can change. We got a new attitude. Back then, black people couldn't do that. They get killed right on the street, and nobody would say nothing. So the messenger, as he's called by his followers, had a very serious job to do. You understand what I'm saying? Don't let the white man pull this old dead jive stuff on us and pull down another great black man, and then we hide our leaders, and he keeps putting new pictures on the dollar bills. The so-called Jew traveled all over the world trying to find men that were responsible for what they call the Holocaust, right? Am I right? Yes or no? That's right. They chase these men down, 60, 70 years old, and try to hang a 70-year-old man. Or hang him to death. Correct? Correct. I agree. One of them. But who's chasing down the men that flew the planes and gave the order to bomb Hiroshima and kill millions and millions and millions of the Japanese? How come they're not being trialed for war crimes? Because that was still war. Right. And they went over there and dropped bombs. You understand? Know and flattened people, melted buildings, killed dogs, pets, babies, everything. But they got awards in America. They got a button pinned on them and said they did something great by killing millions of Japanese people. That was an award. But the so-called German Jew is hunting these people around for the same war period and hanging men 60 and 70 years old. Old man, he's going to die in a week anyway. They want to keep him alive long enough so that they can kill him. And you don't see that that is a treacherous, low-life nature? When you take an 80-year-old man and hang him, he's going to be dead in a week anyway? You go, they put him, they took a, one of them German Jews, they took him and put him in the hospital and kept him alive so they could hang him. The man was dying from heart trouble, and they kept him alive just so they can hang him. That is sick. That is really sick. You understand me? I do. That's a dangerous mentality. Don't let them pull that stuff. Don't try to get conflicts going between what me and Minister Farrakhan believe. Oh, definitely not. We got to get our heads together. You know why? Because all we got is us. I constantly try to keep in touch. I know two brothers from the temple, and we, we've had meetings and conversations. And stuff Don't get into like conversations. You know why? Because neither one of y'all are equipped to solve the problem. You're too young in the doctrine yet to really understand. Right. What's happening? And y'all can end up enemies because you want to be right. Because you know how we are. We love to be right. We be right when we know we're wrong. Stand there, walk around. I know I'm right. I know I was right anyway. Know you're wrong. Black people love to be right. And it's not worth it at this day and time. The bottom line is, Minister Louis Farrakhan is trying to gather black people in America to get ready for whatever is going to come down on us. We better be ready for it. And we're going to need each other. Regardless of the differences in our doctrine, we need each other. And I realize that, and he realizes that. And we're trying to get them Sunni Muslim brothers to realize that them brothers in Saudi Arabia and Isnad are not the least concerned. And as long as these Sunni Muslim leaders keep letting these Saudi Arabians pay their rent, they can dictate what they teach their children. They can't even get mad, because I was in a meeting, and they even, they, they're so knuckleheads that they didn't even know I was sitting there. They hate me so much that I was sitting in the meeting, they didn't even know I was there. That's how dumb they are. And you know, you know what I heard the Arabs tell Sarah Wajah in the meeting? You, you can't give the kutbah because you don't know enough Arabic for the park they had for the, the last uh, Ramadan 
that they had, they told him, you are, you're an imam for the Americans, but you're not qualified to give a khutbah because you don't know enough Arabic. Then they leaned over and started talking to each other in Arabic. You know what they said? These American Negroes are really funny. This they're saying in Arabic right in the mosque. This Palestinian imam up on Masjid Puruki, they call him. We're sitting up there, I'm sitting up there, looking at them, and they're like, the, the, the Palestinians are saying, this, must, this is a Sudanese, so I'm all right with them. But the Sunnis who hate me, who look at my picture in a million books, sitting there looking right at me and couldn't see me. Damn, he blinded them. I mean, I mean that's, that means they really must dislike me, and I love the heck out of them, because I'm the only one standing up and saying, Arabs and everybody who don't care about black people in America, if you don't care about my people, if you care about us, spend some of those millions of dollars building universities teaching our children Arabic, instead of buying yachts for your daughters. The way the white man throws up a building in Memphis Stuyvesant in one year, you understand, they be throwing up houses, they call it, low-income housing. If the Arabs really cared about the Sunni Muslims, he would take Bedford Avenue where they got all their mind, but one mosque on Bedford Avenue. And that's the African Islamic Mission. Master Jamia, because they're part of us, the people you see in the green and the gold. All the rest of them guys up and down there ain't got a dime. All together. You think the men would get together and put their money together so they can provide some food, clothes, and shelter for their women? No. You got sisters living in shelters. Brothers marrying sisters, not giving them their dowry and then divorcing them. And you have the nerve to call us calf and say we ain't Muslims. They ain't living none of the Islamic tenets of the Sunnah. We talk about Ansar. They don't, they racist. We're racist, but one thing is for sure, our children are eating every night. Our women have rules over their heads. We, we, our shoes ain't ran down. We paying our bills. No, we don't own nobody anything. The white man can't do nothing for us because we don't rent, we own. You understand what I'm trying to say? That's building a nation. And that's something we picked up by listening to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Because if I would have listened to them orthodox Sunni Muslims that I used to sit up under in State Street, I'd be doing the same thing they're doing on Eastern Parkway, starving to death. But I listened, and this, I said, let me listen to this man here, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he knows what he's talking about. Let me listen to him about do something for yourself. And we and saw started doing for ourselves, and this day we're able to say, see what we got? In the name of Allah, Arabs ain't give us one dime, and they've tried. They call me to meetings, you know what I tell them? Bug off. I, literally. Imam Isa, we'd like for you to come to Saudi Arabia. Uh, we're having this, a meeting of Imams. I said, is any Americans going to be there? Did it, did, you know? Yes. Is, is uh, Wallace D. Muhammad going to be there? Yeah. He's, is he an imam? Yes. Then I don't belong there. Because if that's what you classify an imam, I don't belong there. If, if Saraj Wahaj, you can't even speak Arabic because an imam, I don't belong there. They didn't learn four surahs from some Pakistanian book, now they're imams of the Quran. I don't want to be around these kind of people. Because I don't want to have to say I agree with them and then change my educational program to theirs and then my kids stop learning Arabic. Because if I comply with them, I'm going to have to agree with all their programs. And their programs are showing me that their kids ain't studying nothing. So what am I going to do? Make my children stop learning Quran because they don't want to pay their bills? I can't do that. Don't let these people divide us. Spend time trying to tell the Sunni Muslims, don't like us. Get your program together. We better start working together. You ain't got to listen to me. And I won't listen to you. Let's listen to the Quran. Let's make a point that whenever we get into the argument, it must be in the Quran, not in the Hadith. Because that gets into arguments. Let's go to the Quran. And if you don't want to touch the Quran, then I don't even want to talk to you. If you're going to bring me a whole bunch of books by men, and I'm telling you to read the Kitab Allah, and you talk about Hadith, I say Kitab Allah, but in the Hadith, Kitab Allah, but in the Hadith, then there's something wrong with you. You understand? But you people better get your leaders back up and talk about them. Talk about Marcus Garvey. You know what I'm writing these books for? So y'all can go out there and say, Marcus Garvey did this, and this, and this, and Noble Juali, he was a, and Marcus Garvey was a Muslim, and Noble Juali was a Muslim. And they killed Dr. Martin Luther King because he went to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad converted him. His last meeting with Honorable Elijah Muhammad when he came back and said, I had a dream. I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen it. Why he said, what is he talking about? You look at the last tape, you see everybody standing around him dressed in white. That's right. They ain't standing around no suit and ties. They right. standing around dressed in white with tar gears on their heads. They don't look like no Christians to me standing there. Look like a bunch of Ansar standing around Dr. Martin Luther King. The white man said, he been to the honor of Elijah Muhammad, and he got millions of followers? Kill him. Forget civil rights and peace marches and all other beautiful things that Dr. Martin Luther King was standing for, because he stood for a lot of beautiful things, but he meant well, he, meant, he had a good art. When he said everybody can sit together, he, that's a beautiful thought. White man don't feel like that, but it's a beautiful thought that everybody on earth can become one family and stop killing and taking from each other. 
But if you think the United States is going to agree with that and then give half of its revenue to India so they can starve, you're crazy. If you think they're going to share the wealth of America with people in Ethiopia, you're crazy. He's not going to go back to eating hamburgers so that, and, and, and from steak so some Ethiopians can have food on their table. He don't do that. He just give them some grain. And if he's interested in helping the people, he wouldn't give them grain. What would he do? He would cultivate the land over there and show them how to grow their own food. But if I keep giving you grain, that means you got to keep depending on me. He knows what he's doing. You know why? Because he's a devil, weak and wicked. And his trials and tribulations are to destroy the sons of Allah, you. That's all he stands for, is destruction of everybody else on this planet. You understand? So don't let them do that to you. When you're the brother of the nation, Islam talks, say, wait, we are not going to argue this time. We're going we're gonna to hold hands and we're going to walk together. You understand? So people will see the unity in us. We're not going to fight anymore. And if you have a difference in opinion, have a difference, we, let's, not, let's, let's do everything in our power to avoid that. So I can meet you on Salaam Alaikum or Alaikum Salaam. And I can leave you and we pray together. And we'll, so we'll talk together about Quran and read it, but no debate on who God is and what you think God is. Because none of y'all know what you're talking about. The bottom line. And Minister Farrakhan has a mission he's on in the name of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I got to learn to respect that. Because me and him are going to need each other when the white man comes down. He ain't going to say, these are the answers, so don't hit them. Only hit the ones that are, and if you sisters and brothers in there with that Negro mentality think that the white man ain't going to hit you upside your head because you ain't a Muslim, you got another thing coming. The white man ain't into that stuff. He sees us as just a little more fanatical than you. He going to hit you upside your jerry curls too. He going to slap them false eyelashes off you. You can try to look white and try to be Christian. When the white man started spraying down south, you know what he was telling them? Them brothers told him, all we want to do is cross this bridge to go to the church to pray down south. You know what them crackers told him? You ain't praying to my God. My God wouldn't recognize your prayer. This really took place down there in Alabama. Literally, it's on tape. That's how them crackers see you. So you were born again Christian and you worship Jesus and that cracker will take that stick and whip your head without a second thought. We better get together, we better get organized, and we better start doing things for ourselves. We better start respecting each other for what we are. Stop badgering each other and trying to find faults with each other and always trying to destroy each other. We better get, in. get them silly frowns off your face. You ain't got nothing to worry about. Somebody cares about you. You survived slavery, Junior. Somebody cares about you upstairs. After all you've been through, you still can spell your name. Black people should be walking around grinning, rejoicing, and being exceedingly glad. Because great is your reward in heaven. Because all the prophets before you were also persecuted for righteous name's sake. Y'all should be happy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has found way to give you noble Jali, Marcus Garvey, the honorable Elijah Muhammad, Sheikh Dawood. I mean, so many leaders that have come to try to uplift this, not this nation. Us. You understand what I mean? Are y'all with me? No. no. We should be happy he cared that much about us. Let me give you a little inclination. The white man was stuffing pork in you, right? And Allah had us eating watermelon. And the white man used to make fun out of black people eating watermelon. Now he found out that watermelon flushes the stomach. <laughs> so while the devil was making, forcing us to eat that filthy pig, Allah had a joke being made about us eating watermelon. The watermelon was keeping us from getting our systems destroyed. So that this day, when the light came, our dome can handle it. Because you look at some brothers from years ago, and you try to hold a conversation with them, and they're gone, mentally gone. They can't even hold a straight conversation. You ought to be happy that you're intelligent enough to still learn, to make decisions for yourself, and stop giving yourself over to him. Throw Jerry out your house. <laughs> stop trying to look white. Look at Oprah Wimpy. Look at her. I mean, come on. Who's she for? How's she going to talk black stamp there trying to look white? Be yourself. Y'all are the most beautiful people in the world. If, they, if you wasn't, everybody wouldn't be trying to look like me and you. Here we are trying to put white powder on our face and white people are laying on the beach trying to get back. Here we are straightening our hair and they're getting their hair curled. White kids want an afro so bad they don't know what to do with themselves. I see white people in Jamaica trying to wear dreads. It looks like a dead poodle's on the head. Looks matted. They want dreads. They want anything. They want color. They want lips now. They're getting shots in their lips so that they can have lips. Years ago, they were making fun of our big lips and our bulging eyes. 
Now they got eyeshadow and eyeliner and to make their eyes look bigger and silicone shots to make their lips look bigger. Yet they say they hate the Africans and how we are so ugly. Everybody in the world know we the most beautiful people in the world. They know God got this many different shades of colors of flowers in it. A white person is a white person. He looks the only thing you can liken him to is an uncooked sausage. That's the only thing. And I, mean, I heard Brother Malcolm say that black is the only color that can produce every other color, and white can't produce no color. It's the absence of color. And the absence of color means the absence of mood, because colors create moods. <laughs> That's why they can't dance. Because with the absence of mood, there's the absence of soul. With absence of soul, there's the absence of rhythm. With absence of rhythm, there's the absence of coordination. Go to Africa, they be playing three different drums with three different hands, patting their foot, moving four limbs at the same time. White people say, wow, they're colorful people. <laughs> we got a whole lot in the name of Allah to be proud of as a people. We may not have much money, but we'll sit on our stoop, take an oatmeal can, turn it upside down, and bung go away. We could be suffering, but we'll find something to laugh about. You understand what I'm saying? We are great people. We have a very good spirit. We have good karma, as they say. And with all the stuff we've been through, we are good people. And you know what's so bad? All the stuff the white man did to us, we still like him. And don't try to tell me you don't. Because it ain't in you to dislike people, because you are just like your heavenly father. A white woman will fall down in front of you and you'll feel sorry for her. And so would I. Because it just ain't in us to be as hateful as we pretend to be. If you see an old white woman, you stop shaking your head back, I see you. If you see an old white woman fall down, hurt herself on the street, you'd care. Don't tell me you wouldn't care. Now you'd sit there and tell me, if you saw this old woman fall, you wouldn't care. Not even a little bit. You know it's in you because you got the presence of God in you. With all they've done, they've kicked us, spat on us, hang us, raped us, killed us. He mas I mean, he emasculated us. He did everything to us. And still, black people come to that mic and say, well, if a white person asked to move in, would you let them? <laughs> They do. They still come and say, if they ask, would you let them? You know why? Because we are a merciful people. That's why. We are a merciful people. We are created like our creator. And that's what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was trying to say when he said that we all are the sons of God. We are God. That's what he was trying to say. He was not trying to say we are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, he knew you didn't create nothing. And the Quran said, if you think you can, let's see you create one little gnat. Only thing Negroes created a lot of disturbances. He knew that. He, he wasn't that. He couldn't be as intelligent as he was to raise a dead nation to such a powerful people and be as ignorant to one little fact that he is not Muhammad, the prophet of Arabia. He knew he wasn't. And don't let the devils turn you against him so they can take another picture down. Take another man out of our history. You understand what I mean? And I'm telling you again, don't be ashamed to be compassionate. It's a wonderful gift. I'm not teaching you to hate white people. I'm teaching you to know his capability. And if I was to teach you about lions, I can say, listen, don't hate a lion, but don't go in his cage. Now, you can say, why well, not? And then go stagger into his cage, and then I won't have to explain it to the next person. I'll say, see that? That guy didn't listen to me. He went in the cage, and now he's dipped. Don't go in the cage, because that lion will make you out of pudding. You see this pudding? See you? And the third brother goes in there, then you start saying, let's just open the cage because niggas are stupid. Now I'm saying this, don't hate white people. Hate is a sin. Do you understand that? For you to hate anybody is a sin. To hate somebody makes you wicked inside. Don't hate him. And if you start treating him the way he treats you, guess what you're going to become? You'll be the devil. If you start doing devilishment. Knowing the dangers of a thing does not mean you're supposed to hate it. Knowing the dangers of a thing means you're supposed to know how to handle it. Do you understand? No. And of course, they say, I'm a hate teacher. The same way they say the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is a hate teacher. And we both say, we don't teach hate, we teach the truth. And if you hate what I'm saying, that's just too bad. Because until I can have an effect on the textbooks in the world and what's being taught to my children, I'm going to teach them about black greatness. If me teaching them black greatness is hate, then that's too bad. But I'm not going to teach them that whites are better than us because some Sunni Muslim comes from Saudi Arabia and says so. It doesn't impress me. It doesn't impress me in the least. You understand what I mean?
No. Are y'all with me? No. Okay. Uh, um, Shaquan Dizilni, Mom, I'd just like to know if you have in the new book of Lamb the same thing that you had in the message of the messengers right and exact when it talks about the breaks down the lessons basically degree for degree and will you mention also the exact date that the, 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 passed? the um, message of the message is right and exact the book of the lamb is basically the same book with more facts in it right. certain elders of the nation of Islam who are residing here now with us who are members close to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that whoever gave us 1970 which I never told them no one gave me 1970 right? right Elijah Muhammad said and I have it on tape, a videotape, that 1970 is the second resurrection. You follow that? It's on videotape. He said, if you want to see it, the brother downstairs can hook the video up before y'all leave, and he can put that segment on. Right. All right? And y'all can see him say it. He'll say, the man, uh, Lomax, is going to say, are you saying that the year 1970 or around that time is the second resurrection? I'm going to say, yes, 1970 is the time of the second resurrection. He's going to say himself, and you'll see him on tape, okay? Tell the brother I said to start hooking it up. No, I'm sure. All right, that's answer. step one. Uh, right. And what happened is they said, no, it was not, because I, I, I said the day he was born, and I left blank, if you notice in all the books, when he died. And I said, I'm not going to assume I know until I know, for sure. Right. But I know but that he said there'd be a second resurrection, so in certain places I mentioned 1970, because he said it. Right. You understand? But he obviously didn't meant that he would die, he meant it like John the Baptist and Jesus, that he'd still be alive for a couple of years when that new leader's head. Mm. You see? I, you see what I'm saying? And that's what they, I said, I see what you mean. So when was it? They said 1973 is when he died. Mm. And it's recorded for 1975. So that's in the book. Shukran right? And the there. lessons, yes, they're there. Plus, I'm writing a book called The 5% Lessons. Mm. And it has all the 1 to 20, 1 to 14, 1 to 36, all of them in there. And all the lessons to see, pre-mathematics, actual facts, all of that's inside it. If I get a chance to finish it. Yeah. Got so many, but y'all trying to get me to write everything. <laughs> uh, I just have one more question. I'd like to know, is it true that Malcolm X wrote the 12 Jewels of Islam? No, it's true that Malcolm X wrote the supreme alphabet and mathematics, like, you know, one is a law and two is what? I mean, one is oh, knowledge, knowledge, two wisdom. is wisdom, three is understanding. understanding. Four is justice, oh. five is power, etc. Six mm. is equality. You know that? A is Allah, B is born, C is to see. He wrote that while incarcerated, yes. Right. But the uh, actual facts is from the lost found English class lessons. No. He didn't Shukran write that. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.